All right, Adam. Come on, man. Come on. Welcome to the show, brother. Good to see you. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. This is going to be a great conversation. I agree, man. I uh, So, you know, just, just talking to you a little bit before we hit record today. It sounds like your background and my background, even though I, I don't know much detail about it just yet, is sounds really, really similar. Uh, but I know we're going to be talking about attachment. We're going to be talking about marriage. Uh, we're even going to be talking about generations, like the the generation now today, the younger generation, a little bit before us, that probably has, they don't have much of a desire to get married. Uh, and just people living uh, quiet lives of, I think, what we call quiet desperation, you know, and isolation. So... I would love for you to share, though. I know your your childhood and upbringing was was not the greatest, but I would love for you to provide some detail. Absolutely. So I grew up in a very challenged, extended family. Uh, a lot of a lot of broken behaviors, right? A lot of people in America, their families have trauma histories, and we don't really have parenting skills. We have trauma adaptations that we then use on our kids. Is a lot of what we do. And and I grew up in a family system, an extended family system, very much like that. Got attachment issues, right? The research shows that over the last 50 years, uh, attachment has grown from every, one, in, one in every uh, three kids had attachment issues. Then it was one out of two, 50% of people had attachment issues. Now the research shows that about 65% of adults have attachment issues now here in America. So it's getting worse, much, much worse. So I grew up with attachment issues and I fixed them. And it was hell trying to fix them by myself. There were no resources out there, no one to help, no one talking about it. And I did it. And then I went to school to become a therapist and make sure nobody else would have to do it alone. And now I get to teach on the world stage and teach everybody how attachment works so that nobody has to do this alone. I am absolutely dying to know about attachment because I've ne we've never talked about this topic ever. Yeah, most people have never heard about it. Most therapists don't even know about it. I've heard the term, but it's like one of those things where you hear the term, you're like, oh yeah, there's that. And you just, you, you don't mm -hmm. really go and research it or hear much about it. Yeah. But I've heard, I heard you say, um, extended family, uh, a couple of times. So were you not raised by your mom and dad? I was, uh, it was just a very complicated family and the whole system is what really trickles down. You learn from your parents who learn from their parents who learn from their parents you carry all kinds of generational issues and you have to hope somebody in there knows how to give love and receive love and cooperate with you and if they don't where are you going to learn that that's a good point do you think is is there a link between families who have narcissistic traits and this whole attachment thing Let's define attachment, and then I'll explain exactly. Yeah, you're, right. be you're, you're on a very <laughs> close in. thing. So attachment is the way that we connect other human beings to give and receive love. We learn it from our caregivers. We learn it from our parents, specifically. Our brain knows we are supposed to have two biological parents, and if one of them's not around, our brain tags that and says, I wonder why. Is it my fault? Some kids, they grow up, and they blame themselves and say, something's wrong with me. People didn't love me or didn't care about me, didn't have time for me. I'm always a burden. They're always angry when I'm around. They abuse me. They neglected me. They throw me in daycare so they're never around. I don't understand why. Whatever it may be, the brain says something is wrong with me on the inside. So no one can ever love me. I have to make people like me by doing things for them, codependency, so that they will never abandon me. Terror of abandonment is this one. I am the problem. I will be abandoned. The other side is something is wrong with other people. They don't act right. They're not fair. They're not trustworthy. They could be evil or they could just be stressed out. I have no idea. I need to keep them away and avoid intimacy with those people. But I have to appease them so that they'll still meet my needs. This is the other side of the attachment coin. There's also a blend of the two where you can get so damaged you have both. And when you have these issues, you don't connect other people to say, hey, how you doing? Could you do this for me? This would be really helpful. Hey, wife, you know what? I'm feeling kind of in the mood today. Could we do that together? Hey, you know what? I could really use some help on this. I'm feeling kind of nervous about this project. Could you help me? Hey, how can I help you in return? We don't do that openly because our brain says no one cares and no one will help us. We play games by making other people like us or we push buttons so people feel good and will be inspired to take care of us or we try to make people grateful or we are constantly fighting against abandonment. And this is why people do not build relationships where they feel health, happy or safe anymore. When you fix your attachment, you can fix all of that. So you asked me about narcissistic families, right? Narcissism uh, is a high trait on the avoidant attachment side 
of the scale of other people can never be trusted. I'm better than most people because I at least try to be honest. I have to take care of me because no one else is going to care about me. And the further you go off that scale, the more you reach narcissistic personality disorder. So you accrue those traits as you have to stay safe from other people while taking care of your own needs. Yes, families with high narcissism traits in them, very, very highly correlated with having attachment issues. Wow. What it I've heard this before, and I don't know if there's any clout to it whatsoever, and that is everyone to some degree is a narcissist. Is that even true? <laughs> Think of it this way. If you have attachment issues and you don't yeah. connect to other human beings very well, you are not going to connect to the secure, calm people who say, hey, how you doing? How can we take care of each other? What do you need from me? Here's what I need from you. You're not going to be around those people very often because those people scare the crap out of you and you don't think that's what people want from you. So you are then going to self-select where you are only around people who have more narcissistic traits and you're going to think everyone's out for themselves. Everyone's playing a game. Even the nice people are playing a game and just trying to get used and, and use you. Right. Was that old song? Everyone wants to be abused. Everyone's, you know, there's, there's a whole song about this, right? Um, if that's all you see and that's all, you know, then it looks like the entire world is full of narcissistic people who are playing games. That's where I think that comes from. Hmm. All right. So I have, I have a question for you then. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I just want you to dissect my situation a little bit. By all means. Uh, so <clears throat> I was raised, you know, in a pretty crazy environment. And, you know, so my mom was you know, married three times and, you know, my biological father left when I was a little guy and then never knew him, met him by accident when I was 12, left again, kind of crazy revolving door of my, of guys my mom was with, dated, married, all that stuff, just mm -hmm. lots of toxicity, abuse and alcohol and drugs and stuff like that. Not me, them. And then I met my father again when I was 30 and <clears throat> there's, there's something really weird that I have noticed. Like I I've noticed that there, I, I have, I grew up with a lot of protective mechanisms, you know, like where I just kind of like, I, I, you know, it's kind of like the Jerry Maguire thing, great at friendship, bad at intimacy type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've really done a lot of work over the past decade to, to work through that, uh, and, uh, and have done so successfully. But here's the feedback that I've always gotten. Larry, you're just too quick to trust people. Hmm. And and I would always think that that would be the opposite because and, and it is kind of true. Like I when when I when someone comes and talk to me or I meet them, like I automatically and I don't it's weird. I don't even think anything differently of it. I automatically think the best of them. Mm -hmm. Like I don't start to pick apart something that could be wrong, broken, missing or weird. Hmm. It's like I autom and and to be honest, like I've often lately here i've like is that a detriment like should i actually not give people the benefit of the doubt when i first meet them and because then i won't be screwed over hmm. but it, it's just interesting i would just love to hear your view on that oh, before we man. move forward you sound like so many of my male coaching clients who come to me really? for this challenge so many of them okay of difficult upbringing, what am I doing? Who can I trust? Who can I talk to? I, I hear this all the time, whether they run their own company, they're millionaires, they're executives, whatever it is, same challenges. So here's what I tell them is this. If you grew up in a difficult environment where you couldn't track who to trust, then a couple of things. I mean, as long as that person is better than what you grew up with, you're going to be like, well, this is great. And you're going to leap into it. Number two, the That's most... True narcissistic people do something called love bombing, which is where they mimic being happy with you, being connected with you, loving you. They mimic it and they do the signs of it without actually feeling it. And they flood you with it on purpose at the start. And this releases a hormone in you called oxytocin. This is a bonding mm -hmm. oxytocin hormone. And it, it almost becomes addictive. It, it's an addictive substance. So you want it and it makes you relax into your relationship with them. And if you also happen to have an issue where you might think that you are the problem anyway, you feel insecure about yourself, then it feels natural to have someone come along and make you feel good in relationships because you're going to say good relationships don't just don't 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 happen for me. They happen to me. So I need other people to feel better. So to beat that, I have what I call the four levels of trust. But let me stop and ask so far. Is that resonating so far? Yeah, I think. I think a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. 
I've always tacked that up to me just being naive. Oh. You know, I don't know. Like, so like for instance, um, you know, we went to a birthday party, me and me and my wife. Um, and it was a bunch of other couples and a few people there I met for the first time. And one of the people there, my wife was like, so what'd you think of so-and-so? I was like, Oh, it seemed like a great dude. Like, well, you know, like really great. Like we hit it off. Like it seems like, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, very easy to talk to. She's like, yeah, there's a huge dark side to that guy yeah. that so-and-so has told me about. And I'm not going to say any names cause it's a friend of hers. And sure. And I was like, wow, really? And she's like, yeah. And like, kind of like told me like all, and I was like, wow, I just really didn't see that. And, but I, 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 I hear and see that a lot. You know, like, well, again, the most narcissistic and hurtful people have to be charming up front because otherwise they don't get a chance to get in and get their needs met. So their charming behavior that gets under your defenses at first is exactly designed to do that because otherwise they cannot get their needs met. So what you need is what I call the four levels of trust. I've, I've got a four levels of trust yeah, system that I it. run people through. It is it's this. So number one. The very, very first thing you must establish before you trust any human being is what are their values and principles and how do they align with yours? So I, I teach male clients, they come in and I say, okay, what are your three core values that you, that you're, you're what's your personal honor code, right? Maybe it comes from your religion. Maybe you just, you know, you live with it. For me, it's honesty, integrity. And compassion. I have to be always honest and tell the truth and make sure the truth is known. I can't let a lie stand. Integrity. I have to keep my word and my responsibilities if I give them. And number three is compassion. I have to do what is truly right for people who are hurting and suffering. Those are my three values. Now, I can't be friends with somebody who doesn't value those things. If lies are no big deal to them, if breaking their word is no big deal to them, if if kicking people when they're down or just not caring about hurting people, I, I, I can't be friends with those people either. So I can't even build a level one trust with people before I establish that. Is that making sense so far for level one? A hundred percent. I think, is it the way, just for clarity, is it the way that this shows up? So I think... A lot of people probably intrinsic, you know, from an intuitional standpoint, probably know what their core values are like, and maybe does, and does it show the way I've always been told is, it is the way it shows up is, I don't know what it is about this thing, this situation, this person, but this feels really right to me. Mm -hmm. Or on the flip side, it's like, man, I don't know what it is about this situation, but it just doesn't feel so good to me. Right. It's when, it's when you go to make a decision, people with attachment issues, they, their decision maker is what will minimize friction and make me feel safe. They usually violate their own principles and values to try to keep safe is what they usually do. That's why they hate themselves. So what makes me hate myself? What choices do I make that make me dislike myself? Where do I feel guilty? Where do I feel ashamed? That's one of the biggest places of finding your core values is where you are violating them because that will tell you that. Mm. Yeah, that makes total sense. And this is probably, I guess, why people who have perhaps good starts to their relationships, and I'm talking about good good relationships, you know, deep relationships, is that those those core values do have to be aligned because if they're not, Absolutely. then it's probably not going to get much deeper than than that. Well, if you don't have those core values aligned, if they don't live to your values and you don't live to their values, if you don't share those, you can't have respect. You can't trust each other, not even level one. You can't do any of that. All right. There's four levels of trust. And if if level one is gone, there's no way to have a relationship of any kind with that person other than a polite, distant one. Yeah. That's or a surface, you know, like wave to each other at the whatever, at the water jug or whatever during the office. Okay. What's level two? Level two, that's okay. Level two is parallel goals, parallel life goals. So if your goal is to help as many people as you can learn financial independence, and the other guy's goal is to take as much money from other people as he possibly can, even if he's stealing from old grandmas, then you guys are not going to align properly. If your goal is to build loving relationships where people are mutually fulfilled, and his goal is to get his needs met at other people's expense, your goals are not going to line up. You need to make sure that your goals are at least parallel, right? I want to raise a healthy, loving family. Hey, I also want that for my family. Okay. We're now dads on a mission, right? There's, there's a podcast right there. Um, dads on a mission with parallel goals that at least 
connect the two of you so you can work together. Now, the closer that your goals are, long term especially, the more you can work together, the more you can build an alliance, the more that the more trust and, and depth of friendship that you can really build. But you have to establish both values and goals based on how they're living their life, how they treat other people, how they respond to stress. Those are the three places you find if they are really living them. The fake people, they can fake these things for the first six or seven months, but the way that they act is what will really reveal the truth about level one and level two's trust. Interesting. What's level three? Ooh, level three is acceptance, mutual acceptance. So I, I teach this when I teach dating, for example. I have guys come to me for improving their dating life. And on date number three, I say, okay, you've, you've talked to them. You got a little bit serious. You, things are getting better. You set them down on date number three and you say something like this. You know what? We're getting to know each other. And I think you're pretty cool. I just want to be real about what, you know, what, what you'd be getting into if you were dating me. And you list one or two challenges that you are still working on in your life. Now, not, not working on, not going to work on, not horrible nightmares that, oh, I'm just miserable baggage. It's baggage that you are working on. So you say, hey, you know what? I used to have attachment issues. I used to be really insecure. I, I used to not be able to be open with other people. And I am working on it. I've done therapy. I've done coaching with Adam. It was great. I took his attachment boot camp course, and I'm amazing now. Um, but I'm still working on it, and I'm working on it every day. So here's what it will show up as in a relationship. You know, if you see me get distant, if you see me kind of get approval seeking, if I pull away during problems, if I'm stressed out a lot and not talking about it, I'm probably doing that thing. So just tell me, hey, you're doing the thing or ask me about it and I will fix it myself. Now, here's what you've done is you've taken a red flag that you have and, and it's kind of like the job question, right? Hey, what's your greatest weakness? Well, you need to have a good answer, but you also need to talk about why they should still hire you anyway. So you take your big red flag. You be honest with it. You say, hey, look, there's a landmine marked right here. It's, it's that guy with a dark past saying, hey, you know what? I have this dark issue right here. I am currently working on it. Here's proof that I'm working on it. And it's not your problem. It's mine. If I do it, here's I'm outing myself. Here's how you would know I was doing it. And I'm working on it. And I am taking ownership of it. It will never be your problem. It's mine. Here it is. Just don't step right here. You'll be safe everywhere else. And when you can do this, and then get them to do the same thing, you, and I got a whole way of doing that, you open up to each other and say, hey, can we be friends or can we be partners or whatever it is? Mutual acceptance of baggage without enabling, without saying, yeah, okay, I'll live with that. It's, you know what? I can accept where you are right now. This is also part of healing your attachment issues right here. It's very hard to do without a good secure attachment. But when you do that, that's level three trust because they can be clear with you about their issues while still taking ownership. Is that making sense? That makes total sense because basically it's AI. I love the analogy too of, of the, you know, the, the person being interviewed of the red flag, your weakness. Right. But you're also stating that, you know, Hey, I would, I would enjoy some ownership and accountability around this. Right. Or like, and I love the thing where you're like, well, Hey, you're doing the thing again. Right. Yeah. For my wife, you know, like we, we have, we definitely have all three of these levels and I know by a certain look, if I'm doing the thing, you know, cause she'll just be like, Mm -hmm. Larry. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And then I recalibrate. Right. So, okay, cool. What's number four. Level four is, is a good one. I love it. It's mutual fulfillment. So you've locked okay. in, you know, we have the same values. You're not going to violate my values and hurt me by betraying those things. You have the similar goals where we are not going to be at cross purposes and I can still respect and trust you. You're going toward them consistently and I see you living them out in your life. So you are trustworthy. That's what makes someone trustworthy. You also know some of my dark side and you accept me and I know your dark side and I can accept you and we're both working on it to get better as people. Level four is mutual fulfillment. Oh, Okay, we're at level three. How can, what, what do you need from me to be a, a great husband? What do you need from me to be a good friend? What can I do that makes you feel loved? And are you willing to do the same back for me? Can you take care of me as well? Can we take care of each other? Mutual fulfillment is the highest level. It's level four trust. And this is where real love forms, I believe. When you walk with somebody through all four levels of trust, you know who they are. And, you, and it, it demands that they have more secure attachments so they're not going to fall apart on you. Dude, I love this. Like, I, I've never had, like, I'm taking notes as you're talking, and I've just, it, everything is just so visual. I'm like, well, yeah, there's that. And, like, yeah, that, yeah. and, like, no wonder. Like, I'm looking at all 
past relationships, friendships, clients, all this other stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And there's this, everything. This is what I do is I make the feelings make sense. That That's my whole job with attachment. Yeah. So. Well, I know one of the things we're talking about, you wrote a book called Exhausted Wives and Be- Bewildered Husbands. Right over is, my head. Right? Yeah, it's right there. I'm very curious as to the four levels of trust mm-hmm. is, does that have anything? I'm, well, that's a dumb question. I'm, pr- I'm sure it probably has a lot to do with this, but it, what, what do these have to do with each other? Yeah. So in my book, exhausted wives, bewildered husbands, what I did was take my years as a licensed marriage and family therapist, um, and look at what was the number one reason for divorce I saw in couples who made it, you know, into try and having kids, they made it five years, they made it 10 years, and then their marriage cracked apart. What was the biggest factor for 95% of divorces in that range? And what I found was it was women with anxious attachment style of, I don't deserve to be loved. I need to make my husband happy. And husbands who had avoidant attachment style usually of, I just can't trust anybody else. I'm going to muscle through and solve everything alone, but never open up and let anyone know who I am inside. And they get together and they can make it work till they have kids. And then she, she gets some hormone changes and all kinds of th- connections that she craves to give those children secure attachment. But she sees dad not giving them secure attachment because he doesn't know how. And she starts pushing him in that direction and it scares him. And he says, what are you doing to me? Why are you pushing me like this? I'm fine. I haven't changed. But she grows to resent him and she grows to be angry at him and to treat him like the enemy because now her kids are anxious. They're stressed. They don't know what dad's doing. They don't feel the connection. And she blames him. She also feels alienated and alone. He does not give her emotional intimacy. He's complaining their sex drives down, but he doesn't do anything to build it up emotionally. He doesn't know how to emotionally connect. And she grows to hate and resent him over 10, 15, 20 years until their marriage is exhausting to her and she's done. And then when she says, I'm done, he says, no, like, what do you mean? I want to fix this. But it's been 15, 20 years of, I don't have time for this. You're being weird. You're being emotional. I don't know what you want from me. So she feels dismissed all that time. She's not ready to work anymore. And he's finally ready to work, but it's way too late. That was the relationship I saw. So I wrote that book because there's a way to fix that. There's one clear pathway to fixing that exact dynamic. So the countless emails that I've gotten over the past eight years, Larry, I don't know what to do. My wife just dropped a bomb on me today that she no longer wants to be with me or be married. And I didn't even see it coming. Yeah. I I can't even tell you how many emails or, you know, whether it's a DM or whatever, it's just these messages. I kind of, I dove into some research and I can't remember where I saw this, but it's, there was a, it was documented somewhere that if a woman said, I no longer want to be married or something along the lines of like, Hey, I think we should try to separate or, Hey, I don't know if this is going to work out that most studies have shown that women have been thinking about this for a minimum of two years before saying it out loud. Is that true? Very, very often longer than that. Yes, absolutely. So can you do me a favor, please? I want, before we talk about the solutions, Mm -hmm. I want you just to briefly go over that whole scenario one more time, just so the guys fully understand. Because that was a lot of information. Yes, I was trying to compute it myself. So let's just take the run of the mill couple and like let's kind of just dive into their everyday life of kind of maybe some behaviors that we even can help guys identify. Absolutely. The couple that you're talking about, like what what do you think that they're are will you? I know you know this because you've been doing this, but what are they seeing like on a on a daily, weekly basis as far as the, the, the dynamics between each other, parenting, she, management of the house, a whole nine yards? She doesn't have needs up front at the beginning of the relationship. When they're dating, she's eager to please. She doesn't have much of an identity. She throws herself into making him happy. She's just, she's, she's worried about how he thinks and feels about her all the time because she's always afraid of abandonment. And he's always hesitant. He holds back. He doesn't share deeper feelings. He doesn't really know how to share deeper feelings. He's kind of relieved to be with a woman that doesn't poke and prod all the time because he doesn't really want to let anyone in that deep. That's why they usually end up pairing up the anxious and avoidant styles like that. So he keeps her at arm's length, but he takes care of her and he loves her. 
and she keeps him at arm's length because she's afraid if she, he ever gets in deep, he'll see that she's not worthy of love. So she does things for him, and he takes care of her, but over time, her emotional needs get so overwhelming that he starts pushing her away, and then she freaks out and chases him, tries to get approval. It's this whole dance about, I need, I need, I need, but I can't ask. And he's saying, whoa, she's always so needy. I don't know what to say. I need time alone. I don't know how to get it. And they make it work. They still make it work when they don't have kids. But once you have kids, her whole biology changes. She gets flooded with that oxytocin bonding hormone that we talked about earlier. She obsesses over the children. They are everything to her to a whole new extent. And she's getting connected with them like she's never been connected with anyone. She becomes kind of mama bear. And she starts pushing him to spend time with the kids and, and telling him, you're not doing enough. You need more time with the kids. They need more time with you. Maybe she's pushy. Maybe she's just subtle. But, but it's always there. There's always signs. And he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what she's asking for right? Her sex drive goes down usually at 12 months and stays down because the oxytocin drive happens a switch. It switches from dopamine until oxytocin at about seven to 12 months. So her sex drive is way down. It's only there when she's craving approval or when she's afraid he's going to leave her. So it's consistently low. And she keeps saying, I need dates. I need a foreplay. I need talking. I need connection. He doesn't know how to do those things. I, I have intentional how to talk to your wife in solution focused sharing for men who don't know how to do that because men don't know how to do it, especially avoidant men. And they just, they, they think, why would I do that? Nobody opens to each other. She doesn't want to hear from me. She doesn't care about my feelings. She can't do anything to help me anyway. Nobody ever has and nobody ever will. So they, they try to be good husbands by staying quiet and staying solitary and staying isolated. And they think they're doing their job and she's dying and she's complaining and she's whimpering. And then she's asking for him to spend time with the kids. She's asking for more intimacy. She's suggesting dates. She's reading books on love. She's going to seminars on this. She's, she's doing everything. These are the women that reach out to me about courses, about training. What can my husband read? He isn't talking to me. How do I make him talk to me? What book can I leave on his bedside table? They're doing all kinds of things. And it's not that the guys don't see these. It's the guys brush them aside because they don't make sense and they don't know what to do about it. So they avoid the conversation. Avoidant men avoid conflict instead of leaning into it and saying, what do you need? How can I help? I don't know how to do that. Who can teach us? That's really, they don't, they don't believe there are answers. So guys, if, if you feel like there's a constant barrage of needs you don't understand and it's escalating, that's the warning sign. If she's still putting in the effort to ask or push or hint, even if you don't get it, that's a great sign that she hasn't given up yet. When she stops doing that, that's when it's dark territory. That's when it's really bad. So if you just don't know what to do, ask, learn, but that's it. It's a lot. Dude, I'm sp <laughs> I am speechless right now. I've never had one guest literally lay out, you know, in 27 minutes, <clears throat> everything that you've laid out, you know, these four levels of trust, all these behaviors that are happening. And as you're saying these things, like so many things, <clears throat> cause I've seen this now for the past eight years in our own mm -hmm. community. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and these warning signs and you know, how men interpret these warning signs. Yeah. Right. And, and I've, I've seen the men, they're just like, yeah, it's there. I just don't know really what to do with that. Or she's just nagging me. She's just being like, whatever. She's right? just like, nagging me. Who cares? Yeah. She doesn't know what she, you know, he goes on the internet and he says, all right, what do women want? The red pill community says women don't know what they want. They're lying to you. Just, you know, be, be better at sex and she'll transform into a porn star for you. This is what's right. on the internet which is be not going to work. <laughs> well, the, the cool thing too, is that, you know, one thing I can, like, I, I, I am a, a, a moron with a lot of things. Um, but one thing in particular that Jess, Jessica and I are good at is our marriage, reading each other. Um, the four levels of trust are there and they're deep, uh, how we work together, how we talk, mm. you know, and, it wasn't always so though. Like we f like face planted for the first probably five, 10 years of our marriage. And, mm -hmm. but the past 10 years have been so much better, but we've had to learn these things, but I've never in my life, man, heard this laid out. Like you just laid it out. Like it, it's insanely clear. 
Well, thank you. Um, this is what I do. Okay, so let's, now that we know, you've got all kinds of guys' attention right now. Of like, oh, yeah. Ooh. Like, oh, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, they're like, Adam, I'm seeing this stuff. Now, what do we go do about it? Three things. Oh, Three well, things. Okay. Here's right, how men transform. Good. Number one, you can only aim for a target you can see. So remember we talked about you and I growing up in difficult, challenging environments. We talked about guys not knowing any different because that's what they grew up with. Models. This is called models. You need to see a model of a functioning marriage. What does it look like to have a functioning marriage? How do they talk to each other? How do they solve conflicts? How does he meet her needs? When she complains, what does he do? What does he do with that information? You need to see models for how husbands act, how wives act, how marriage functions. You need to see models. So number one, you need to to learn models. My attachment bootcamp video course, it's on adamlanesmith.com. It walks you through showing you models for what each step should look like because most people have never seen that before. Number two, once you have models, targets to aim for, you're going to say, how the heck do I make that happen? Right? Maybe you're watching a, a Hallmark movie and say, how do I make a relationship like that? Maybe you're, you're watching a film and the woman is so loving and so loyal and you're like, damn, how do I, how do I get a woman like that? How do I make my wife act like that? Right? And Next comes skills. Skills is how you bring models to life. Skills is how you navigate situations. There are tools, right? Okay, you have an instruction manual for building a house. Do you have any tools and supplies to build that house? That's tools, tools and skills. It's models and then skills to make the models come to life. Now, here's where most men stop. They listen to podcasts, they learn models, they learn skills, they just kind of learn them intellectually, and then they hold on to them, and then they just hope that they're going to be different because they've learned information. But that's the information gathering phase. The second phase, and step three in the process, is experience. You need to go then and use those skills and have conversations with human beings that are different than conversations you have ever had before, and see how they react in those circumstances. So I walk people through what I call the, I, I am an anxious person speech. You go to somebody and say, look, I have attachment issues. I'm anxious all the time. I'm approval seeking. I'm fake half the time. I hate it. I never want to do it again. And I'm telling you because I want, I respect you and I want a real relationship with you from now on. Can we do that together? Now, what you're doing is getting acceptance from that person that you never got from your parents. You're seeing if some, when you rip yourself open, how do they react? Do they spit on you? Do they jump out the window? Or do they say, yeah, man, it's kind of weird that you're being so emotional, but cool. I get it. I already knew this about you. Happy to be your friend. We can definitely do that. What's going to change? What's the difference? And you get a flood of brain chemicals that changes you that says, this is real. People actually care about me and they want real things from me. And then you do that a few times, you do that with your wife, you do that with your best friend, you start to change how you talk to other people because you're no longer terrified. So experiences will transform you. Models, skills, experiences, and you need help from other people to get all three. So what about the guys who just want to wing it? So let, let me, let me, let me rephrase this. So sure. I've been, I've been talking about this for probably years now on the mm -hmm. podcast. Like what the three things that you just said, um, two out of the three, I've been like just hammering and hammering and hammering, mm -hmm. right? Because number one, that's what made a huge difference in my own marriage. But number two, you know, with the guys in our, in our community who do life with us and our mastermind, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. We always... <clears throat> I saw this meme on social media one time that there's three types of people. There's the victim, there's the content zombie and the executor. And they it kind of align with what you're saying. So the victim will tell you all the reasons why they can't be successful in whatever fitness or relationships or whatever. And then they'll go out and actually search for proof and be like, see, I told you I wasn't patient with my kids. I told you I'm a bad communicator. Look what I just did. Mm. And then there's the content zombie who that's better because that person's hungry. The content zombie is not the best definite, but it's someone who's just like, okay, I'm ready to learn. I'm, I'm, this is the guy who's consuming audiobooks and podcasts. But then when the rubber meets the road, it's like, okay, I think I'm going to go try this thing. Mm. And then they do it like one time and it really doesn't fall the way they want it to. And they never go back yeah. to it again. Yeah. And then there's the guys who go with the experience, skills and tools mm -hmm. These are the guys who ha are in conversations, I would say, at least weekly. They're working with a group of people or other people or, or a person or a coach. Mm -hmm. And then like, okay, this is what I 
want you to go do this week, right? Or this is what we need to go do this week. And then when you come back, report back on how it went. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones who are implementing, right? The, the, the skills and the tools. But I, I think our society, and this is what I've been saying on the podcast is that our society kind of sets us up for this really weird mentality around this, which now that I'm on the other side of it, I truly look at it like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like it's almost like when Morpheus gives Neo the red pill, right? Or the blue pill, I can't remember which one, but Mm -hmm. he sees everything for what it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I used to go about this and a lot of us go about this like, well, if I need help, like, I remember actually telling my wife in the first five years of our marriage, we're not doing counseling. I'm not doing marriage therapy. Like that's for people who have serious problems and they're broken. Our problems aren't that big yet. And when they are big, then we'll go. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, I was like, that is the most asinine thing to say and the most asinine way to go about this because nobody does, we don't do that in other areas. Like I don't wait for my teeth to rot out before I'm like, yeah, I should probably call the dentist or I don't wait for my engine to fall out of my car to be like, I probably should go get the oil change. Right. Right. But we, but, but why do we, why do we do this in our relationships? Why? I don't understand. Because we don't believe that better is actually possible. And if we go to some professional who's going to make it worse is what we think. They're going to rip everything open. And there are no solutions to conflicts. People with attachment are petrified of conflicts because they don't believe conflicts will ever be resolved well for them. So they have to resolve conflicts silently and alone so no one else can get involved so they can control every part of it. That's a big piece. So when you go to someone who drags all the conflicts out in the open, you feel hopeless and you feel like it's going to get worse. Imagine, though, if you were an athlete, right? Imagine you're an athlete yeah. yeah. and you want to get better at your craft and you want to be better. So you're going to just practice alone in a room silently forever with no mentor, no coach, no teachers, nothing. No, this is how guys approach our relationships though. Especially if you have attachment issues, get a coach, get somebody, get some training, learn, grow. There's so much beyond not being miserable. I I, I fall into this trap myself. Sometimes I'm on, I'm on social media all over the place teaching. and, and And I tell people, all right, guys, here's how you're going to be safe in your relationships. And I have to stop myself and say, no, 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 no. I'm not here to make you feel safe in your relationships because that's the bare minimum. Here's how to be happy in your relationships. Here's how to have a wife that adores you. Here's how to be a husband you are proud to be. Here's how to be a father who raises generations of kids that thrive and thrive together, not separate off because they can't be together. They form a family a family unit that thrives. This is how you do that. That's what we're supposed to be teaching. So guys out there, if you think you got a white knuckle life, you're missing everything. God, you just spoke to everybody. You know, <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting. If you go back to Karate Kid, hmm. right? I'll never forget that part where Daniel LaRusso, he's got a black eye and he's practicing his kicks and Mr. Miyagi comes into the apartment to fix the sink. And Mr. Miyagi's like, oh, karate. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, learn from book? Like, and he looks at him like he's got two heads. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. Like, why would you learn from a book? It's not like you're going to really get better unless you have someone who teaching you spar with you and all that other stuff. But that is fascinating. I can truly understand though, why people are apprehensive. Cause it's like, Oh my gosh, like if we could get help, like that means I got to peel back the onion layers and really take a good look at this thing. And maybe I just feel, and it's, so it's, it's probably a safety thing. Like, do they feel, even though they're miserable, maybe it's that certainty piece. Like, well, if I'm miserable, at least I'm certain that there's a level of misery that I can live with. And if I go to therapy and we open up Pandora's box, holy crap. Like what if, what if there's a whole other level that neither one of us can live Two with? Problems. Is that the mentality? Two problems. Okay. Anxiously attached people that think they are the problem. If you go to therapy and peel back all the layers, all they're going to teach you is that you are an imposter who is in value, who is, who is unlovable. You're an unlovable imposter that the other person would do better without. And so you think if we go to therapy, they're just going to tell my partner that they should leave me. There's no hope here. There's things are never going to get better. I'm never going to be better. Why would I try this? This is horrible. It's a disaster waiting to happen. And for the other side, guys who are avoidant, a lot of more men are avoidant than anxious. They say, 
nobody else is ever going to be fair with me. So if I go to therapy, the therapist is going to be unfair and is going to side with my wife. My wife is going to side against me. They're both going to work against me and pressure me into things I don't want to do. And I'm going to have to be miserable in my marriage even more than I am now. It's going to make it worse. Why would I do this? That's what they see. So of course they avoid therapy. So interesting. I just had this guy reach out to me on on Facebook Messenger a couple of weeks ago and he's like, Hey man, like I applied to be a part of the mastermind. I'm really excited. He set up a call with our team, talked through everything. And then he messaged me. He's like, Hey man, I need some help here. I really, really want to join. He's like, I'm looking like the seriously to save my marriage. And he's like, uh, but I can't get my wife on board with letting me do this. And I was like, I was really, really intrigued because apparently from what he had also told me is his wife is doing, she's doing her own work. Like she's big into personal development, being the best, you know? And so you would think like, and I was like, really? I was like, that's really fascinating. I was like, well, he's like, what do I do? I said, I would just simply get very curious and appreciative and go have a conversation with her and say, Hey, you know, I've, I've noticed that there's obviously maybe you don't feel comfortably doing this. Like, is there, is there a reason? And dude, she gave him a reason and he got back to me and he's like, here's her reason. She's afraid that all I'm going to do is get into your group and complain and you guys are going to validate me and, and I, I'm going to be right and she's going to be wrong and, and it's going to be the demise of our relationship. I was like, really? I was like, that's fascinating. I was like, because we actually quite do the opposite. <laughs> we, we, we are really good at calling guys out on their BS. Yeah. And, uh, but it's, it, now that you're saying this, so like I'm, some of her mentality makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Like, it didn't at first, but it, yeah. it does now. Some sounds like perhaps an avoidant wife, or maybe he's burned her before. And if he says, my wife won't let me, that's usually the mark of an anxious attached person who needs approval and, and permission for everything in their life. So they connect to somebody who gives them approval or doesn't for everything in their life and tells them what they are and are not allowed to do. That, that's a very common anxious and avoidant dynamic right there that you might have exposed in them. Wow. Wow. So, okay. I, I, I'm just loving this, by the way. I could talk to you like for five hours. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'm not going to do that to you, though. But but I, I am curious now. So <clears throat> we now know the four levels of trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, we now know the behaviors that show up in some of these relationships over time and mm-hmm. some breadcrumbs. Uh, we know the three ways that men can transform. Mm-hmm. Let me ask this, though. For men who want sustainable transformation, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've worked with clients like this and so so have I, where they get really excited to to do something big Mm -hmm. and they come out of the gates just full steam ahead and they're like rocking and rolling and then all of a sudden, boom, they go right back Mm -hmm. to old behaviors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then you'll question them on it and be like, and basically the things that come back is like, you know, it's kind of like my history, man. I'm a, I'm a big starter, but I'm not a finisher. Like I'll hear something like that. No. Um, but why is it that human nature, and we see this on New Year's Day every year, right? People come out of the gates, you know, full throttle. The gyms are packed and all these people have got resolutions. And all of a sudden, boom, they're all gone. Two things. Why does that happen? I, 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 two things. I have a lot of my male clients, um, we get about halfway through the process and they say, Adam, I am so terrified. I'm going to backslide. Uh, in ways that I always have before. And I say, are you backsliding? And they say, absolutely not, but I'm afraid I will because I always have. I tell, tell them two things. Number one is accountability. You need to have the people around you knowing what you're doing so that they will all pressure you. That's part of the anxious attachment speech that I, that I gave there. Um, I am an anxious person, opening up to people, getting accountability, letting them know what you're doing so that you cannot go backwards, right? If I start faking it again, people say, hey, you're doing the thing. If everyone in your life says, hey, you're doing the thing, you start doing the, you stop doing the thing because it's embarrassing, right? So make it harder to go backward, make it as hard as possible to go backward because of emotional pressure from other people. Accountability is the number one thing you can do. Number two, though, 
is getting real results that feel amazing so that you are addicted to the good results. Now, what I have found is when people fix their attachment, even a month into fixing their attachment, it feels so incredibly good. The rush of brain chemicals you get, the, the different feeling in your, in your brain, the safety you have in your relationships, the happiness you feel with people when you didn't know you could be happy with them, all the bonding hormones that flood through. You cannot go backwards because you cannot live the way you were living anymore. Most people are living the way they live out of ignorance that there is a better way to be. Let me give you an example. I had one couple come in and um, two weeks previous, they had discovered he was having an affair and she was pregnant and she wanted to fix the, the his wife was pregnant. The mistress was not. And uh, the wife wanted to fix the relationship because they were about to have a baby and, and she wanted to fix things with him anyway. And he wasn't sure if he did or not. And I did a full assessment on them and it came out she had very severe anxious attachment style. He had very severe avoidant attachment style. Their attachments were horrible and had been for life. And they, they, neither one of them knew that. So I talked to them and said, look, have you ever thought about this, 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 this in your relationship? This piece gave them models. And they were like, is that possible? And I said, yeah. So I walked them through it. We did two full sessions together, two plus the assessment. So three, three sessions. So after three weeks of doing this together, opening up, talking, bonding, like, like you, like you are with your wife, it sounds like, like you guys are together doing what you told that guy of go to your wife, ask her those questions, talk with her, fix those things together. Three weeks of doing that to five weeks after an affair was discovered, they were happier together than they had ever been in the history of their relationship. Even as newlyweds, even as a dating couple, they were more fulfilled. They were content. They were safe. He, there was no way he was leaving that woman because they were bonded like super glue. And, and the feelings were incredible that they had. So then the idea is, well, could they go backward? Well, they could. But now they've experienced so much richness and fulfillment and the things you are biologically designed to crave. It is almost impossible to go backward at that point. Dang, man. Wow. Can you, can you share like just one or two, maybe three things that they did that sure. was the launching pad for them? Sure. So opening up and saying, we both feel scared. We both think that this thing's hanging by a thread, but we don't think we can talk about it. We don't know that we can just ask for our needs. I can just ask you for things like for him. I can just ask you for sex. That's real. I can just do that. The thing, the ability to sit down and have a meeting once a week and say, how are you feeling in our relationship and how can we help you feel better? How are you feeling? Most people are terrified to ask their partner. How are you feeling in our relationship? Oh, it's horrible. I'm glad you asked me. Let's break up. That's what most people think. But no. Hey, how are you feeling in our relationship? And, and what can we do to make that better? Hey, what do you need from me? How can I love you? Mutual fulfillment, level four of trust. Hey, what are the challenges you're facing? And, and how can I help? Level three trust. Hey, what are the goals we are aiming at as a couple? Let's unify around a shared purpose so we can keep going back to it. Level true, level two trust. Building the levels of trust together and then following through on them. That's not just an exercise to get into a relationship. Then you, you continue with them to have maximum fulfillment. They talked. They kept meetings, they tracked how they were feeling, they built better connections together, and they opened up about how scared they were and how they both wanted to fix it. And that made all the difference in the world to them. They had the conversations everybody else is too scared to have. Wow. Wow. So it's, it sounds like what, what one of the culprits are, and I know that there's deep psychological things and attachment and all that, but it's it's the lens that we're probably viewing the other person ourselves and the relationship through that might be completely and totally inaccurate. Like the story that we're telling ourselves is actually fiction. Yes. You don't believe that water makes things wet. You think water makes things dry and you believe it with all of your heart and there's no evidence in the world that can make it otherwise. And you will never test that theory because you just believe it. Why would you go test that theory? But when, when you are confronted with evidence of it and when someone else shows you, Hey, water's wet. Look over here. You can't unsee it. You can't go backwards because you've seen the real truth and it feels amazing. Dang, man. <sighs> you know, I, a lot of what you're saying, and I just want to share this with the audience because I, I, I talk about my marriage with Jessica a lot and it's because 
I feel insanely blessed to have what we've created together, you know, and it's unbreakable. I feel like, mm-hmm. and, and she, she would tell you the same. Like I, I love her. I'm crazy about her more 20 years of marriage than I was at 10. And she would tell you the same. And, but we have, but here's the interesting thing. We have conversations like this on the weekly, like, Hey, let's think about, you know, w- what was like one of the questions we ask ourselves, what's one or two things that I did this week that you truly appreciated that I could do more of. And then we also say, is there anything that I missed? Like, was there something that I could improve upon or something I said or did that you didn't like that you want to bring to my attention? Right. And then we also talk about like, you know, we, we, we ask each other questions like, Hey, if we were celebrating an incredible month of October at the end of October, what would you be telling me that happened? That hasn't happened yet. Things like that. We have those conversations a lot. I actually, we were out on a date, this past week, it was the same day as we went to the birthday party. We went to dinner afterwards. And I asked her, I said, what are some ways that I could be a more, a, a better husband to you? Like more, more fulfilling or something like that. And she just like looked at me. She's like, she's like, Larry, you ask me that stuff all the time. She's like, there really isn't much else you could do. Like every, like we talk about this stuff all the time. And she's like, I always appreciate you asking, but like, and I'll tell you if, if something mm. goes awry, but one thing I can tell you is that as I took an entire page of notes and I'm sitting there thinking like all, and it's all these things that we pretty much do now that we had no clue 10 years ago, yeah. but we've implemented all these things that you're talking about, but I've never seen it quite staring at me back on a, on a screen like I am right now mm-hmm. with all these notes. And mm-hmm. it's so freaking clear, man. Mm-hmm. It's unreal. Um, I, do you have time for one more question? Absolutely. So, okay, I really want to help the audience with this one. Sure. So let's just say we've got several men in the audience right now, and they're just like, okay, like, I know what's going on. I know it's needed. But, like, I I even think about the guy who I was messaging back and forth, and I I could feel that guy's anxiety, like, even going to have a conversation. Like, oh, my God, like, what is she even going to say? So let's just say a guy is like, holy cow, like, I'm really, really clear now because of the podcast like where we're at and maybe some work we need to do, but maybe the guy's like, but dude, I'm dreading how, like, how do I even broach this topic mm. with my wife? And mm. she even take it seriously. Mm. You know, I, um, I built a resource exactly for this, for you to take to your partner and to make this work. So I have the really? attachment boot camp video course and okay. it walks you through all the conversations you should have had. It walks you through the pieces of fixing yourself fixing your relationships with people and then fixing your romance. So what I recommend men do is this, go to your partner and say, Hey, I'm realizing that I am not the person I want to be in my relationships. You don't have to make it about her, make it about you. I am not the person I want to be in my relationships. I'm not the person I want to be for you, for our kids, for example. And the exhausted wives, bewildered husbands. I, I talk about how it's almost impossible to think, fix things with your wife until you fix them with your kids. Because the number one divisive issue is how she feels her kids are doing uh, with you as the dad. So if you become amazing as that dad, that loving father, then it's very easy to rewin her trust and her love. Mutual goals, right? Level two and level one. So when you unify around that, I am not the man I want to be. I want to be better. Pick up a course, pick up my course. Hey, I would like you to take this course with me. I want to learn about myself and I would love to take you on this journey so that we can learn about me and learn about us together. Can we do this together as a couple? That's a great way to work it in. Lead, make it about you, make it about fulfillment. You don't have to beat your head against a rock and say, I'm so sorry, I'm the scum of the earth. Just say, I want to be a better person and you make it better. And then you bring some resources and tools and you say, I am suggesting these things. And most women, if they are even reasonably open to working with you, will say, okay, I'm willing to explore this with you, especially if you're passionate about it. Let's give it a shot. Take it that path. Take that pathway. Do that. The I statements and the complete ownership works a lot better than you're not doing this and you're not doing that. (laughs) Correct, because it right. tells her tells yeah. her what your values are. Your values are yeah. intimacy, trust, keeping your word, building greater relationships. You have ownership of it. She's not going to have to push you along and be your mom. Does all kinds of things. Wow. 
just out of curiosity, what do you, what do you suggest to the men for wives who are just like, whatever, fix yourself anyway, fix your attachment. Number one, because if, if she divorces you, you're going to need good attachment to go through this process. And you want to make sure that you have done everything you humanly can to restore that marriage. I've seen marriages come back from absolute death to amazing, thriving gardens of love when the man fixes his attachment. 97, maybe you don't know this number, but 97% of women convert to a new religion when their husband converts. 97%. Women react to husbands who are authentic. So if you step up and build authenticity, either she will respond to you or you will be better prepared when she just divorces you. Either way, there is no lose in this scenario. You're going to get stronger either way. So fix your attachment. So do yourself work regardless. Do yourself like, work regardless. I, I say uh, every now and again, like on podcasts, like, because I, I subscribe to that as well. I, I totally 100% agree with that. Because I'm like, if you got the luggage in this relationship, you don't want to bring the luggage to the next one, regardless of this one works out or not. Correct. Yeah. Adam, this was awesome. <laughs> yes, it like, was. Thank you. <laughs> it was awesome. I mean, so detailed, so organized, and it's completely and totally the framework we need as men and you did it in such a, the, the cool thing too is you didn't really bog us down with a lot of like psychological big words, right? You made things very digestible, very simple, which I, which I really appreciate. I know the audience does too. Mm. That's what I do. I make the big things simple and I make your relationships make sense. That's my job. So cool, man. Uh, where can people find and connect with you? Oh, I'm all over the place. Uh, you can find me on adamlanesmith.com. Lane as an L-A-N-E. On there, you'll find my attachment boot camp video course you've heard so much about. You'll find my coaching on there. You'll find all of my resources. I'm also on YouTube as at Attachment Adam. I have over 450 video guides. And if you prefer some shareable vid uh, shareable static images and, and carousels and things like that, I'm on Instagram also with reels and shorts over there at Attachment Adam. You can find all kinds of viral information that's cool stuff that i've shared you'll find everything you need to get some help got that well we're gonna have all the links in the show notes for you guys and by the way um happy thanksgiving gentlemen yeah and you can you can tell adam uh thank you for thanksgiving and and he might say you're welcome mm -hmm. uh because that's when this show releases so adam thank you so much for coming on you can you guys you can connect with adam we're gonna have all three of those handles his youtube channel Instagram and his website. If you want to head on over to the dad edge.com forward slash four fifty for this show. Again, the dad edge.com forward slash four five zero for this show. Adam, this was awesome, man. I could seriously, we could Joe Rogan this thing into like a three hour podcast if we really wanted to, because this was freaking gold, man. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you for having me. You bet. <laughs>